Welcome to the Faith Today podcast, conversations inspired by Canada's Christian magazine. I'm Karen Stiller. Way back in the 90s, a much younger me heard a much younger John G. Stackhouse Jr. speak at Regent College, a seminary where he would go on to teach for years. I still remember John at chapel, I think, because of his kind of scary smart and also punchy and funny and a little offside, but in a good way. I think the prolific author, Crandall University professor, and yes, Faith Today columnist, is still like that. His latest book is Can I Believe? An Invitation to the Hesitant. And in this podcast, John speaks with both Faith Today editors, Bill Fladeris and me, about the book, what stands between some deep-thinking people and faith, and also shares his own experience in church these days. Please enjoy. John, your latest book is called Can I Believe? An Invitation to the Hesitant. In the introduction, you give a very quick overview of the faith, and then you write, how could any sensible, decent person believe it? This book focuses on this single question, but let's make it harder. How, in fact, have two billion people found this very strange story and this deeply checkered heritage compelling? Some of those two billion aren't very bright, to be sure, classic Stackhouse line. (laughs) Uh, Many of them have evident psychological problems. Not a few seem to be in it for the money and power that any popular movement can offer, but all two billion of them across all lines of culture and class, ethnicity and language, time and place, Ivy League professors and Oxford Dons. How can those people believe? I skipped a line there. That is uh, a very powerful question. And I wanted to ask you as we start to talk about this, your book, and just, you know, hopefully some other topics. I think when I read that, I realized that in my own life, I've absorbed the idea recently that it's our personal stories of God working in our lives that are the most sort of powerful evangelistic tool. But your book, I think, is suggesting otherwise. You're you're giving a very kind of, it's not overly academic, but you're giving a, like a classic apologetic approach to evangelism. And I just wondered if you could dive into that. Well, I actually do think that our stories of how we have encountered God and how the presence of God's Spirit in our lives has transformed us and relationships around us really is the heart of what we have to say. Christianity is a religion that fundamentally wants to convert people not to itself, but to introduce people to God. We're not just trying to help people become Christianly religious, as if being a Christian and practicing it well is going to save you. We don't think it will. We don't think practicing any religion well is going to save you. We think God's going to save you. So Christianity is just a vehicle to reconnect us properly with God, and we think that's through Jesus Christ. So the encounter with God in our own lives and in the lives of our churches really is the core of what we have to offer. And and that to me actually was not a place I expected to come to, having studied and practiced witnessing for the faith or apologetics, making defenses for the faith for, through much of my career. Um, but I've come to conclude that that's the heart of our message. It's the heart of our religion. So it better be the heart of our apologetic. And that's where I end up. It's just that a lot of people often have a lot of brush between themselves and that. They have a lot of uh, obstacles between themselves and those experiences. They're not even going to try. They're not even going to seek those experiences if they think that the Christian church is an unpromising place in which to look for such experiences. So the best this little book can do is to clear away some of that brush and some of those misconceptions and say, actually, Christianity is worth a serious look, but it really isn't about believing what a book says. It's about coming to believe what Jesus says. And I suppose it also needs, there's some counterbalancing in terms of if our personal stories are the way in, a lot of us have kind of wonky personal stories. And so depending on who you meet first as a Christian, that can just as much invite you in as turn you away. Yeah, yeah, to be sure. So there has to be some kind of linking or shared aspects to it as well that helps us to get past individual anomalies or whatever in unusual cases. 
Well, in fact, the, the, as we know, the public profile of Christianity right now in North America and really throughout the Anglosphere is pretty bad. And so we need more than ever to be able to say, you know, we're, we're not all crazy. You know, we're not all terrible. We're not all this, that, or something else. In fact, most Christians don't live in America or Canada or Britain. They live in Africa and Latin America and East Asia, and they're not caught up in all this nonsense. So uh, among other things, we want to say, take a look at the big picture. Uh, Don't focus on horrible little details, even if they're fairly big details in your life. John, who is your ideal reader then for this book? Is it the skeptic who is questioning religion or searching, or is it the Christian who needs better arguments? Yeah, it's a really good question. And my audience is the interested inquirer. I'm not trying to do battle with the hardened skeptic. That can be sometimes a useful thing to do. I've done my share of intellectual sword fighting, and it can be fun. It's good exercise. You know, you might come away with a certain grudging respect for each other, but normally people don't change their minds very much when they're fighting for their lives, so to speak. They mostly are pretty defensive. So, and almost, I would say, upwards of 90% of all the apologetics books I've ever come across are clearly written by Christians for Christians. They can say that they're being written to the larger world, but they clearly aren't. Most of the authors are pastors or teachers in Christian institutions whose own education is from Christian institutions. And I feel that one of the things God's given me to share is considerable experience outside the Christian subculture with having to earn uh, most of my higher education uh, on secular campuses, Queens here in Canada and Chicago in the States, and then eight years teaching religion at a large public university at the University of Manitoba. And then since then, doing regular journalism in non-Christian places and having to deal with non-Christian editors. So somebody has to be able to speak outside the Christian world. And even people who think they're doing that, I think clearly aren't. So my attempt is to provide a book. Frankly, the ideal case, Karen, is, is that a Christian knows about the book, has an inquiring friend, and then says, okay, here's a book I'd like to talk about with you. I think you'll be able to connect with this. And and probably a fairly smart friend. I mean, I have a great instinct to make as little money as possible. <laughs> and I, for years, I talked with a really good friend of mine who heads a very big U.S. publishing house. And we talked about my writing a kind of popular airport book that would sell lots of copies of the sort. He's a Christian. He, he wanted this to succeed. But when I finally felt it was time to write the thing, I wrote to him and then I wrote to my editor at Oxford uh, with, with whom I'd done half a dozen books before. And he said, you know, if you want to write for me, you're going to have to bring this down to the level of a smart 12 year old. And he said, you can do it. I've seen your journalism. You can do that. But is that what you want to do? And I realized that that's pretty much every, what everybody's trying to do is to write the very popular apologetic to the middle of the bell curve. And that's a very great thing to do. I mean, that's where most people should aim because that's where most people are. But very few people are aiming at a New Yorker reader, at an Atlantic reader, uh, or in Canada here, the, the walrus reader. And I'm trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and certainly in your book, as with a lot of academic books, the first section is a lot about defining terms and shaping you know, where the discussion is going to go. And oftentimes in a journalistic case, you'd have to skip over all that and just start with the meat of things, right? So even as I read it, I felt a little impatient, like, oh, this is a sort of a more of an academic approach where we're going to make sure that we lay all the foundations before we get to the good stuff. But obviously that's necessary to present a coherent argument. Well, that's true. In my experience, though, it's actually very smart people who stumble over some of those questions, Bill, because they they have the settled idea that religion is in one category and serious thinking is in a different category, a different compartment. Yeah. Faith is over here. That zone is populated by spirits and mystical experiences and flutters in my stomach and intuitions that come from God knows where. And then there's hard-headed thinking over here. And 
So that's such a fundamental misunderstanding of religious faith generally and Christian faith in particular that I felt I needed to deal with that up front. Like what would it mean to actually seriously engage in the religious quest if you're a thoughtful person? And for many people, many thoughtful people, they feel they somehow have to kind of stop thinking and just kind of open themselves in some way to the universe. Like they're really clueless about what it would mean to investigate this in a rational way. So to me, it wasn't so much the uh, chapter in academic throat clearing and prolegomena, as we say, uh, although I'm sure it does strike some readers that way. But for my target audience, I kind of felt I had to do that to, as you say, is lay the groundwork for what's to follow. Here's what a good argument would look like in the religious sphere. Yeah. You know, it strikes me, John, when you're saying that, I thought right away of a professor I had recently when I went back to school in a secular setting, who at one point turned to me and said, sometime you need to explain to me how a literate person like you can actually believe this stuff. And it's it seems to me that's the question you're probably answering in this book. That's exactly right. That's exactly my concern, is that in our culture today, and our culture, I'm thinking broadly of what I call the Anglosphere, right? The British Isles, Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and in this culture, there is a very broad, but very thin and patchy familiarity with Christianity. Most people either think they're Christians already or have some contact with Christianity, and they think they understand it, unlike every other religion in the world. Right? If you ask the average Canadian or American, give me the five pillars of Islam or give me the four noble truths of Buddhism, they, they won't have any clue and they'll cheerfully say, I have no idea. I might be interested, but I, I don't know. But if you ask them the basics of Christianity, they're quite confident they know. But the poll data show us that they really don't, that most people really couldn't give a serious and orthodox interpretation of such very basic Christian ideas as the Trinity or the incarnation of Jesus, or the atonement, what Jesus is doing on the cross. In fact, I'm not quite sure how many pastors could actually define those well. But certainly people in the street can't do that. But those are basic. Like, that's that's world religions 101 stuff. So what Christianity has is, a, is an unusual, in fact, I would say a unique cultural burden in our countries nowadays, which is to try to convey its message to people who think they already know, thank you very much, what it's about, but really don't. So we have a lot of unlearning to do to help our neighbors say, no, no, we don't believe that, actually. This is what we believe. And it can go both ways. Some people think that we believe weirder, stranger, uglier stuff than we actually do. But many Canadians think we believe anodyne, even boring stuff that we really don't. Like our message is actually quite interesting. It's really strange. So part of what I've tried to do in the book is to strangeify Christianity to a culture that thinks it knows, thank you very much, what Christianity says. Christianity is actually much weirder than the other major world religions. I've been teaching world religions off and on for 30 years. And I would say the religions that have won in the Darwinian struggle for success among the other world religions, because lots of religions have come and gone around the world, the big religions, the one that command, the ones that command millions of adherents, I think I could fairly say they make a lot of sense. You can see why somebody would think that. I don't see how anybody could make up a story like the Christian gospel and then get somebody else to believe it. Like maybe some particular lunatic could make the story up in the first place, but how do you get anybody else to believe it, let alone become the most successful explanation of reality in human history? Like that in itself needs some explaining, and that's part of what I try to do in the book. Yeah. I like the weirdness approach, and I really enjoyed that aspect in the book. And I also like it when you sort of exaggerated things sometimes to – get people to rethink. For example, one of the things you say is uh, you expect there will be motorcycles in heaven. And it's just a great way to get people's attention. And maybe you can tell our listeners why you would say something like that. Well, we have this horrible cultural myth that when we die, we either go to hell, which is a place of fiery torment where devils in 
indulge their sadistic tendencies and poke us with pitchforks, which isn't what the Bible says, or we go up to heaven and we get issued a shapeless white robe and a harp and we get, you know, go to cloud 232B and we sit on the cloud and we start playing our harps at each other. And this just goes on indefinitely. <laughs> Sounds very boring. <laughs> it's it's excruciating. And you know, the worst thing about this is that I can't die. <laughs> yes. Right? It's like the oh, world's dear. worst church service and it never ends. Well, you know, who wants a piece of that? Most, most people don't. But that image comes partly from certain medieval ideas of the beatific vision as refracted through Dante, as refracted through Gary Larson and Farside cartoons. Right. And that's what's in people's heads. So we got to say, no, 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 we're, we're not going up to some kind of spiritual heaven. That idea of leaving the body and leaving the earth and going up to a spiritual heaven, that's a Greek idea or an Indian idea. It's not, it's not a Christian idea. The Christian idea is that we're not we're going up, we're going forward. We're going forward to earth 2.0. We're going forward to a resurrected life with a new body and a new world. And it's going to be as good as this one, except better. And the best stuff in this world goes forward to the world to come yeah. or it's improved upon. So since I love motorcycling and I had to give up motorcycling once because my brother and my wife wanted me to knock it off. I was driving in Chicago and they were afraid I was going to get picked off. I felt that out of love for them, I'd say no. But also I was assured by the idea that in the world to come, only a few decades away, I could have a garage full of motorcycles. And if not, then something better, like maybe a Star Wars speeder doesn't even touch the ground. Or maybe we just fly, which is even cooler. So part of what I see in the last two chapters of the Bible, which are easy to find actually, because they're the last two chapters of the Bible, is a vision of a new city and a new planet where the very best things of this world, gold and precious stones, are so abundant that they're used as construction materials. Streets paved with gold, city gates carved out of a single pearl. So that's the language, that very graphic, very physical language is meant to convey to us uh, when you trade some of the goodies of this world for what's to come, you're making a good trade. Yeah, I feel that that's really helpful in our society today that that a lot of people have this misunderstanding, whether it's Christians, uh, whether it's non-Christians or even some Christians that don't, we don't really think about heaven or what God has planned for this world and for us in a lot of detail or in a lot of right detail. The other example that you have where you talk about that is you talk about the scars that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus has scars and, you know, it had something to do with us having bodies in the future. Well, the only person we know about, of course, who's gone on to the next phase of existence is the resurrected Jesus. And we only have a few glimpses of him uh, recorded in the Gospels in the 40 days after his uh, death and resurrection before he returns to heaven. And Jesus clearly is embodied. He actually says to his disciples, I have flesh and blood like you do. Flesh and bones, he actually says. And he eats with them to show that he's not a ghost and he's not a, a hologram. He's not an apparition. He really is what he was, but new and improved. I mean, uh, one of his f first disciples comes to the garden and she's looking for his body to look after it in burial. And through her tears, she sees a completely able-bodied, fit young man. So she assumes that's the gardener who else would be there at that hour of the morning because she's completely expecting to see a dead, beaten up, crucified body. That's Jesus. So who's this nice looking? But well, then she, when he calls her by name, she realized that's Jesus. So the disciples recognize him. In fact, another story has Peter recognize him at, at a considerable distance. So he clearly looks like Jesus, but he doesn't look like the beaten up Jesus of Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Right. That wouldn't convince anybody that he'd beaten death, more like death had beaten him. So he clearly looks like the new and improved Jesus. And I think that's really encouraging for those of us, which are most of us who aren't very happy with our bodies, who really do hope in the world to come, we'll be able to trade up to a, a, a newer, handsomer, more beautiful, more fit body. And, and I think that's true. I think that we become beautiful versions of ourselves, recognizably ourselves, but more beautiful version of ourselves. But Jesus retains 
these scars on his hands and feet, not, again, I, I rush to assure nervous listeners, not from some car accident, so he's forever scarred, but as badges of honor that these scars are there the way a hockey player rolls up his sleeve to show you scars he got uh, when he took another guy into the boards or the way a soldier is happy to, to, to show you scars he suffered in battle as signs of his devotion and his patriotism and his, and, and his prowess. Uh, Jesus shows us his scars as signs of his love, but is otherwise beautiful. Yeah. I'd love to shift gears a little bit, John. A few minutes ago when we were talking about what people believe or don't believe, even within the church, you said something like, even some pastors don't believe that. In your Faith Today column, you sometimes offer a critique of the Canadian church. So, And you've taught at seminary, you're at Crandall University. I wonder if you could speak for a few moments to where you feel we need to grow in the Canadian church and also maybe how we can prepare our pastors and priests even better, in your opinion? Well, that, of course, is something uh, we've talked about a lot, and I'll keep talking about it in my column. And in terms of our discussion today, I would say at least two things. I think, first, pastors who understandably spend their higher education in a seminary of some kind or a Christian institution of some kind, and then spend their working life as professional Christians— I think can rapidly lose their ability to think like their parishioners, let alone like non-Christians. I was thinking one of the reasons I'm, I'd, be, I'd be so terrible at being a salesperson is that if you're good at business, you have to be able to intuit what your customers want. And I'm sufficiently odd that I never can intuit what other people want. Uh, very well. I mean, I can have, do a little bit of that, which is why I can write some journalism, but I'm still, you know, an ivory tower academic pretty hopelessly. Uh, somebody who's really good at business really gets like, this is going to be popular. People are going to really want this in a way that kind of baffles me. Well, I think pastors have to be aware of that too, where they forget because they're reading Christian magazines, they're reading Christian books and, and Christian websites, interacting with professional Christian colleagues. And they can forget without meaning to how other people are making their way in the world and how the other people are making sense in the world. And so I think that a book like this, I hope, can help model the way we need to speak more effectively to people who aren't already playing our language game, so to speak. And then secondly, I think that as preachers, and I am a part-time preacher here and there myself, we need to give people good reasons to believe besides I said so, and I'm the pastor, or the Bible says so, and it's the word of God. I think even serious Christians, they want to believe the pastor, and they want to believe the word of God, but our generation doesn't take anything on the authority of what somebody else says. So if you think they're going to believe you just because you're the pastor and you have a theological degree, I mean, just check out Facebook. I mean, people are arguing with me all the time. They have nothing approaching my expertise in religious studies. If I were an astrophysicist, they would just say, yes, sir, that's very interesting. But because I'm in religion, everybody's an expert. Everybody weighs in just as if their voice matters as much as anybody else's. So pastors have to realize this is a chaotic situation where authority counts for nothing. You've got to show that the Bible says that and show why this makes sense, that this is good stuff that God is giving us in order to improve our lives. If you really want people to do anything other than say, well, that was an interesting opinion, don't really agree with it, and blow it off. What feeds your faith, John? Well, I do have one good discipline, Karen. I am not very disciplined about my diet. I'm not very disciplined about exercise. I used to be an athlete and those years are way behind me now and I'm, I'm fat and kind of lazy. So I'm not a very disciplined person, but I have found essential to take half an hour or so every morning in the Bible with usually another Christian book to prod my thinking, uh, a book of prayers and reconnect with God and reorient my life with God because I, I just need to. I can't live properly without reconnecting with God steadily through the day. And if I don't start with that kind of fairly significant reorientation exercise, it just becomes difficult for the day even to remember that God's around, let alone uh, connect with him properly. So that individual time is very important for me. 
I think that being married to a strong woman who is also a strong Christian keeps me on the straight and narrow. Whereas church for me is more tricky. I love the church and I love serving the church, but I'm not, of course, your typical churchgoer, and I find church going to be a mixed experience. And I sympathize with people who don't always enjoy going to church. It seems for some of us that church is aimed at somebody else. And so we can listen in, we can we can kind of hang around the periphery, but I often feel like everybody around me is enjoying this a lot more than I am. Uh, and so I sympathize with people who don't feel really strongly connected with individual churches. But as I've gotten older, I, I can look around and appreciate what's going on better than I used to. It isn't all about me, of course, and uh, can sometimes vicariously enjoy other people's enjoyment, even if it's not always striking home for me. I think that really fits with what you were saying about church leaders needing to be careful to envision other ways of viewing the world that's not the Christianized way of looking at things, right? And one of the things that's really salutary in your book is all the examples from other religions that you bring in as well to say there are these other ways of living and looking at things. And it's so easy to think that our normality is normal for everybody. I read a book recently called Five Wives about the missionary martyrs in Ecuador, uh, a sort of fictional re-examination of that. It's really got me thinking about the cross-cultural communication of the gospel, right? And how culturally located our experience of our religion is, right? And how someone else from a different orientation, maybe someone who's a Hindu from India, That's a very, very different way of thinking. And if we are only trying to speak to people that are kind of like ourselves, that it's going to fall very short. Well, increasingly, I think that's the case, as as, we all know here in Canada, where our neighbors are Hindus, uh, our neighbors are Buddhists or Sikhs. Exactly. um, And beyond that, people who call themselves Christian or self-identify as Christian in some other way, aren't really very Christian. And what I found interesting and really quite challenging coming out here now to leave my former teaching position, which was really an intensely Christian experience at Regent College, to teach at Crandall, which is a very seriously Christian undergraduate university, but we welcome people right across the board. And in my first year class on the Christian way, I send out bio sheets that students fill out and I get a glimpse of their interior lives. Uh, Only half of our students would be church going Christians. And the other half are, you know, trail off in a kind of long tail uh, into just complete paganism with no clue. They couldn't tell Jesus from Paul. And uh, so I find it really interesting. That's before we even get it to our international students who are coming from completely different religions. So t- to me, the, the challenge is here now. Um, it's it's yeah. not coming. It's here. Canada is pluralized. And uh, heaven help the pastor who gets up and presumes this bank of common knowledge and common conviction. Um, I don't know what church you think you're preaching to, but it's not the church that's in front of you now. And what I see from your book, it's not even common knowledge, but it's common concepts or ways of seeing the world, right? If you're from another religious, another religion in another culture, you're using totally different definitions about what's good or what the purpose of life is or how to, you know, it's a different, it's, it's using different language, right? So we need to be aware of that. Yeah, we sure do. John, as we wrap up, I'd love to hear your words of encouragement for pastors, just because we've been talking about pastors right now in the next sort of six months of this horrible pandemic situation we find ourselves in while we're recording this conversation. And I guess maybe just for the church, like what should we be doing right now? How should we be caring for each other or caring for the people around us in our communities? One of the useful exercises I put myself through in preparing to write this book, having, in a sense, prepared for it my whole life, was to reread two books that came out in the early 1990s. They were edited by philosophers. One was Tom Morris, the other was Kelly Clark. And they collect testimonies of heavyweight philosophers who have come to faith in God. And in these two books, 
that came out, as I say, roughly the same time. We, we get dozens of life stories of how very smart, very analytical people come to believe this story to be true. And one of the things I found interesting is that probably half of them talk about reading C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity, that that single book uh, is a, was a big deal for them. That wasn't too surprising. What was a common theme, so common that I, when I first read those books 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I didn't really notice it. And then I really noticed it this time is that more than half of them have a powerful spiritual experience. And most of those take place in a church, not in a seminar room, not in a library, not on a long walk with an equally brilliant friend. It was seeking God and being willing to worship with other Christians or with Christians if they weren't Christians yet, and simply asking God to be real to them. And when I started looking for it, it was everywhere. These, these super intelligent people needed to be loved by Christians, needed to see the integrity of a well-lived life, and needed to encounter God. Well, that's what every good church does. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be good at 20 fine arguments for the Christian faith. And that's what I long for for our churches is do what you're already doing and do it well. Be a good church. And that is the most powerful apologetic we can offer the world. Thank you for listening. Check out more podcasts and subscribe to Faith Today magazine for free at faithtoday.ca. This podcast is produced by the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. If you enjoyed it, please rate or share it.